Well, welcome everybody to another edition of Lewis at Large. Yours truly, Warner Lewis from the flight deck. And of course, that means some extremely smart talk radios in your future. In this segment, uh, I am extremely pleased to have Christine O'Keefe Apkowitz with us. Uh, an exciting new work called Dr. Mutter's Marvels. Uh, and we will be talking to her uh, about that. It is all about the dawn of modern medicine, an extraordinary story indeed. Uh, she is from the East Coast originally, but now lives in Austin, Texas, a very hip town. And many of you that listen to this show, I know, uh, spend a lot of time down there. And uh, we're trying to encourage her to come here as well. Anyway, Christine, how are you, my friend? Very good. Thanks so much for speaking with me, Warner. Yeah. By the way, do I what, what, do I have the title right? Is it Dr. Mutter? Is it That's Mute? a great question. We do know that he was born Thomas Mutter in Virginia in 1811, but he, when he went off to study surgery in Paris, he decided he was going to be the premier plastic surgeon of America and was going to come back and showcase this new field. And uh, to add flash to his name, he added a umlaut to his name. Mm-hmm. And it's still debated at the Mütter Museum itself whether or not he additionally changed the pronunciation. Some people continue to call him Dr. Mutter, but I believe if you add an umlaut, you're going to change the pronunciation, right. so I so call him Dr. Mutter. Dr. Mutter. But no one knows okay. for sure. All right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll interchange. Well, again, a, uh, again what, what are the two dots called? An umlaut? What is that? <laughs> yes, an umlaut. An umlaut. Again, the two <laughs> dots above the U. Very well. Hey, by the way, also on setup for, for uh, our guest here, she is a best-selling nonfiction writer uh, and poet, having written uh, for the New York Times a lot of books on her own, uh, the Onions AV Club, very cool, NPR Science Fridays, and the UK newspaper, The Guardian, amongst others. So anyway, a lot of credibility, a lot of fun, a lot of energy here. Well, let's do this. Let's give our Lewis at Large listeners a little bit more of a setup. Let's take us back. Again, the story, uh, the 1800s and medicine, very, very crude, uh, even in these United States, correct? Absolutely. Uh, Medicine back then was a bit of a wild, wild west. Uh, You didn't need a license to practice medicine. You didn't need a degree. Uh, You didn't even need to study medicine. You literally could just put doctor on a placard, hang it outside your house, and just start sticking leeches on people. Uh, It was also a time before germ theory was proven, so doctors didn't wash their hands or tools prior before any uh, medical procedures, and it was a time uh, important in understanding Mütter. It was a time before ether anesthesia. So he was a surgeon who performed reconstructive surgeries on the severely deformed in a time uh, when patients were awake during the surgeries. Okay, Kristen, question for you. Uh, You talk about all these non-licensed sort of fake doctors running around the Wild West and all over, frankly. Was Dr. Mütter, Dr. Mutter, uh, was he in fact licensed or was he, because I know his, ultimately he was very humanistic in his approach, but was he in fact licensed? He received his medical degree from University of Pennsylvania, which was the first medical school ever started here in the United States, uh, founded by our own Benjamin Franklin. And uh, and he he became a professor in a medical institution, Jefferson Medical College. Um, but in, in order to understand why he was such a humanist and why he had such a patient-centric philosophy towards medicine, which is definitely not how medicine was taught or uh, you know practiced during his lifetime, was that he uh, was a patient for most of his life. His entire family, his parents, grandparents, siblings, they all died um, before he turned to the age of eight. And um, and he himself, you know, even though his family was decimated by disease, he survived but was very ill throughout his childhood and adolescence and young adulthood. And in fact, would die at a very young age, um, at the uh, age of 46. Um but uh, but Mütter, you know, throughout his childhood, met with doctors, and I think understood what he would want out of a doctor-patient experience very clearly from those experiences. And he believed he should have been treated with clarity. He he should have been, you know, met with clean hands and tools, and and seen as a human being who is suffering and not a problem to be fi- fixed or a disease to be cured, which is how medicine sort of treated its patients back then. So when he had an opportunity to, to teach. Um, He was given the chair of surgery at the premier Jefferson Medical College at the age of 31. Those are the philosophies that he most strongly espoused. I mean, he was an innovative surgeon doing work that no one else in the country was doing, but 
tied to that, he also talked about his patients as human beings um, and, and, and that they deserve to be treated as such at a time when that was, you know, definitely not uh, how people, uh, people in medicine viewed their patients, which is weird by today's standards, but very common back then. You've written six books on poetry. Yes. Why suddenly about medicine, particularly as it's related to the brutalness, the leeches, the bleedings, <laughs> uh, the disfigurement surgeries, uh, failed, et cetera, et cetera? Why this subject? Um, I was born and raised in Philadelphia, uh, which is where the Mütter Museum, uh, which is Mütter's you know, legacy, uh, is based. The Mütter Museum is sort of an infamous cult museum. It's a science museum that showcases what we would call medical oddities, 19th century uh, oddities, like uh, women with horns growing from their heads, or um, rib cages deformed by corsets, or they have a nine-foot colon uh, that was extracted from a human being on display. <laughs> and in fact, you can go to the gift shop and buy a plushy version of their mega colon to take home with you, in case you're interested. Um, and it was a rite of passage for all Philadelphia school children to visit this school, uh, to visit this museum and sort of be shocked and awed by it. Uh, and I never realized how unusual it was until I left the city and people began asking, what's the deal with that museum? And uh, I didn't have an answer for them. And it turns out, really, neither did the museum itself. You know, they didn't know a lot of information about its founder. Um, so when I was given the opportunity to earn a scholarship, I paid my own way through college um, based for writing a story based on the life of a scientist or scientific discovery. I thought, maybe there is a story here. Maybe the story of how this bizarre museum came to life uh, might yield me the scholarship money. And so I wrote the uh, then director the late, great Gretchen Warden, and said, I know I'm not the usual person that you would allow into your medical archives. I was an undergraduate studying screenwriting. At the time, I was running a poetry slam out of the basement of CBGB's, the historic punk venue in New York City. Whoa. But I really am interested in this man and his story, and, and I would love to explore it more. And in the spirit of the Mütter Museum, you know, they opened their doors to me and said, we would love to know more about him. Um, please come in. You're, we will give you anything you need. And I walked into the archives. Fifteen years ago, this upcoming December. So it took 14 years from when I first walked into the museum to when the book came out in hardcover last fall. Uh, and so it was a very long journey, but to have the book Dr. Mooder's Marvels come out and have it be a New York Times bestseller for three months was so beyond my expectations. Yeah. But, you know, it means so much that the story of Mooder resonated with so many people in the same way that it resonated with me as that undergraduate just stepping into the archive for the first time. So you worked on this throughout the your other professional dealings that you were doing sort of off and on is that because uh research tough to find or there were stories that w that would go one place and then they'd lead you another and another and another and it just really took that long to put it all together absolutely the research was very difficult for this story. I mean, Mütter's uh, uh, story was really lost in history. And the way that I was able to dig it out was by going through sort of unusual primary sources, um, uh, uh, student journals, um, teacher minutes, uh, you know, rare biographies that you can only find if you go to specific archives, obviously letters and diaries that I, I pulled from that time period of people who knew Mütter. Um, it was very difficult. So I needed to really leave my job and work on this full time in order to really do the book justice. And I didn't have the self-confidence, honestly, to, to think that I was the type of person who would be able to write this story uh, until I had already um, published my first book of nonfiction, which was a history of the poem slam movement in New York City, a contemporary history. Up until then, I thought, wow, this is an amazing story. But people like me don't get to write these stories, right? I was a screenwriting undergraduate, a poet by trade. You know, this was a 19th century medical history. But no one else was telling me that, uh, you know, and that's something I like to talk to about other writers or really anyone who wants to, you know, explore an idea that's outside of their comfort zone. Uh, if you feel like, you know, that, that you want to do something, but you're not the type of person who gets to do it, whether you think I'm not educated enough, I'm not bright enough, I'm not young enough, I'm not attractive enough. Ask yourself if you're the only one telling you that, <laughs> because frequently it is just you. And other people are so interested in, in pushing you forward and having you achieve your dreams. And that was certainly um, the, the case with me. As soon as I said, you know what, this is something I want to do, the Mütter Museum came in behind me and we applied for grants together and fellowships. And I got support not only from the museum itself, the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, but I got a year-long writing residency 
residency at the University of Pennsylvania, and a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, which all supported the writing of Dr. Mooter's Marvels. And I think that you can tell, you know, when you read the book, um, I'm a longtime reader and lover of nonfiction. I love really interesting stories that read like novels, but are filled with really interesting, true stories. And I tried to fill the book with all the sort of most delicious and strange and bizarre stories that are, you know, that would make you want to stop and go, oh my God, listen to this. I can't believe this is true. Um, and and I, I hope that readers find the book as a joy to read as I did researching and writing it. Well, let's dive back again towards your character, Dr. Mooter, Dr. Mutter, uh, however (laughs) you please, uh, on this show. Here is a professional. He sees some of the sort of archaic and almost brutal methods uh, of what at the time were considered modern surgery, whether it was real or improvised. Tell us, how was he able to affect change here? Well, you know, he was in a position of power. Uh, as the professor of uh, at Jefferson Medical College, which was one of the premier colleges in America, he influenced a generations, multiple generations of doctors, um, young men who would go on and become very important people in their field. Uh, and Mütter, you know, his philosophies were in contrast with other philosophies being taught at the same institution. Most famously, Charles D. Miggs, who was sort of the antagonist of Mütter, a, a real life man whose ideological stances were in total contrast to Mütter's, where Mütter was very empathetic and patient-centric. This was the chair of obstetrics who taught his students, um, you know, men who would go on to treat women, that women's heads were too small for intellect, but just the right size for love, and that men were their masters and lords. I mean, just to, to teach that kind of contempt for your patient is shocking by today's standards, but he was the best known and most respected obstetrician in his time. And you compare that to Mütter, who, you know, would spend days and weeks uh, meeting with patients and and desensitizing their faces through surgery, you know, um, prior to surgery, doing preoperative care, doing postoperative care, which wasn't done prior to Mütter. I mean, Mütter uh, created what we now know as recovery rooms. Prior to that, if you got your surgery done at a surgical clinic, they would just stick you in a wagon and drive you home over the cobblestone streets of Philadelphia. And he thought this was barbaric and insisted that rooms be created so that his patients could recover. And his own home institution did denied him it. They just didn't understand why it was necessary. So he took it upon himself to rent out a floor above a local restaurant. And once he was done with his surgeries, he would move his patients there so that he could keep his eye on them and make sure that they healed in the way that he believed they should be, you know, their their progress should be made, keeping their wounds clean and keeping them fed with the best food. Uh, and that was all absolutely, you know, against the, the grain of what contemporary medicine was like. And at first, some of his Students were shocked by him and preferred, you know, the older school uh, theories of medicine as espoused by Miggs. But over time, they were gradually won over. And, you know, the generations of doctors that Mütter inspired, and I detailed a lot of them in the, in uh, Dr. Mütter's Marvels um, in the chapter about his legacies, um, you know, uh, are incredible. You know, we, we still benefit to this day by the work that Dr. Mütter inspired through his students. Well, we know that the medical community historically has been tough to change from time to time. There's, there's not necessarily old school thinking, but certainly innovation and understandably at times is viewed a little bit askance as kind of, well, is this really another nutcase or is this for real? I'm curious as to over time, it, he must have faced some resistance back then. I mean, sort of the most famous example uh, that I was able to detail in the book uh, was um, ether anesthesia. Ether anesthesia uh, was discovered as a medical tool in 1846, and he was one of the first doctors to embrace it. He was the first surgeon in Philadelphia to have an ether surgery. It went successfully, of course. But within months, it was banned in hospitals throughout the city. And one would assume, especially with modern eyes, that if the invention of ether anesthesia would be embraced by the surgical community, oh, my gosh, we don't have people screaming screaming out in pain, and we don't have to pay men to hold them onto the table during our surgeries. But in reality, there was any number of factors that prevented it from being embraced. You know, um, the lack of standardized medicine meant that jars of ethers were wildly unstable. You didn't know how much or how little to use that wouldn't harm the patient or cause 
caused them to wake up mid-surgery. You had surgeons whose entire careers were based on performing surgeries on patients who were alive, and they found it unnerving to, to um, you know, perform on an unconscious patient, uh, fearing that they would bleed out without them being able to talk to them and let them know how they were doing. And then you had um, essentially the germ theory not being proven. The rate of death among people who had ether surgeries versus non-ether surgeries were exactly the same because it wasn't the surgeries themselves that were killing the, uh, the patients. It was infections afterwards. So until all of those kinks were worked out, it was a really hard road for ether anesthesia to be widely embraced by the medical community, which was shocking to me. Um, and again, you had tons of stories like that of, of sort of things we've taken granted for in modern ages that people who had to fight upstream to get them accepted uh, is pretty incredible. And I love doing the research for that for Dr. Mooter's Marvels. And I hope people are sort of shocked and awed by that in the same way that I was in reading the book. Kristen, when did uh, the, the, real, the, 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 the work that he did, the research that he did, the results that he started to show, and all of the experiential things, when did that start to sort of work its way into medical schools and into medical thought? later half of the 19th century. A lot of the tools that we use today were invented in the, in the late 19th century. Um, so he did not live long enough to see his ideas be proven true. Things like germ theory, washing your hands and sterilizing tools prior to surgery, that wouldn't be proven until the modern microscope was invented in the 1890s, uh, which was you know three decades after he died. So it's sort of a tragedy that he didn't get to live long enough to enjoy the rewards of being so forward thinking. But, uh, you know, so luckily, you know, uh, this book, I think, will hope reilluminate his legacy and make people deeply appreciate the hard work he did uh, decades before his theories could be proven true. I'm curious also about your any relationships uh, or connections or communications you've had with his descendants and family. How, how have they been? Uh, Mooter, uh, his entire family died when he was a child, so he has no uh, siblings um, to give birth to nieces or nephews, and he himself was childless. So there was no living descendants of Mooter. In fact, the Mooter name, the mutter with an umlaut over it, Mooter added the umlaut to be extra fancy when he returned from studying uh, medicine in Paris, is the only known uh, l- l- people. Him and his wife are the only known people to have that last name in the in the history of America. So, uh, uh, But the Mooter Museum Museum itself is extremely proud of the book. You know, they are sort of the, the physical legacy of Mooter. And uh, there's always signed copies in the gift shop whenever I travel through Philadelphia. And they've had big launch parties, both for the hardcover and the paperback there. So I'm really happy that the book meets, uh, meeted the, met the expectations and even exceeded them to be on the New York Times bestseller list for three months was more than either of us had ever hoped for for this book um, with the creation of this book. So I, I'm really happy with it. And I'm so proud to be told behind the paperback copy of it uh, this month. Well, her name is Kristen O'Keefe Aptowitz, and she is a uh, she's a poet, uh, probably in her heart and by trade. Having, uh, of course, if you worked at CBGBs, and you did a guided <laughs> tour through twenty years of New York City Poetry Slam, uh, we know where the heart is. But she's done some wonderful new work. Uh, um, lot or not, Doctor Mutters, Doctor Mooters, Marvels, uh, a true tale of intrigue and innovation at the dawn of modern medicine. An extraordinary work about an extraordinary guy and an extraordinary place the museum and uh kristen how about uh, can you share with our lewis at large listeners how can they not only get a copy of the book but find out a little bit more about the work that you do sure um i'm going to be on tour for the next seven weeks so uh feel free to catch me at any of my tour dates which you can find at aptowitz.com that's my last name so it's a p as in peter t as in tom o w i c as in cat z as in zebra dot com you can also follow me on twitter at c o aptowitz Okay. And the listen. books can be found at any bookstore. They also have ebooks available for sale um, for uh, digital downloaders. <laughs> okay. So what? So this begs the question: What's your next work? You know, we waited until this book came out. My next idea is also historical nonfiction, and it is pretty gory. But it is uh, the proposal is being put together uh, out right now, so I don't want to spoil it for you. But uh, I, I will be announcing, uh, you know, what the next book is very shortly on Twitter and on my website. So tune into that. <laughs> All right. Well, we would love to have you on again. Best of luck with the book. I know it's already been a success, but it's an interesting story indeed. And uh, I will talk to you soon. Thank you, Warner. Have a great day. You bet. We'll be back with more right after this on Lewis at Large.